The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. Jesus said to the Pharisees, There was a rich man who dressed in purple garments and fine linen and dined sumptuously each day. And lying at his door was a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who would gladly have eaten his fill of the scraps that fell from the rich man's table. Dogs even used to come and lick his sores. When the poor man died, he was carried away by angels to the bosom of Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. And from the nether world where he was in torment, he raised his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he cried out, Father Abraham, have pity on me. Send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am suffering torment in these flames. Abraham replied, My child, remember that you received what was good during your lifetime, while Lazarus likewise received what was bad. But now he is comforted here, whereas you are tormented. Moreover, between us and you a great chasm is established to prevent anyone from crossing who might wish to go from our side to yours or from your side to ours. He said, Then I beg you, Father, send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them, lest they too come to this place of torment. But Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them, he said. Oh no, Father Abraham, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. And then Abraham said, They will not listen to Moses and the prophets. Neither will they be persuaded if someone should rise from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Wow, could I ask for a better gospel <laughs> at a Holy Souls conference? This is a story that comes from Christ, from Jesus of Nazareth. And who do we say Jesus of Nazareth is? We say he is the way, the truth, and the life. So is he going to tell us something that's less than true? Of course not. And what is it that he tells us? He tells us about a rich man and Lazarus. Lazarus, a friend that he knew personally. Lazarus, in whose home he had dined many times. Not so obscure character, but somebody he knew well. And he says, Lazarus and the rich man died. And the rich man ends up in a place of torment. Need I tell you where that place might be? Hotter than Arizona, and don't talk to me about dry heat. Sure enough, he is in that place that none of us care to even think about ever ending up in. Some people even argue that there is no one there. Because God, in his infinite mercy, would not allow that to happen. But you and I, who are familiar with the diary of St. Faustina, know well that Jesus told Faustina that there are, in fact, souls in that fiery, eternal torment. And that they choose to be there. It is not that he sent them there out of justice, it is rather that the choices that they made throughout their lifetime led them to that place. And what does he say about Lazarus? He says Lazarus could have done something different, but he repeatedly made choices in his lifetime that led him to this place. What does the rich man say about his five brothers? Oh Lord, if only you would go and talk to them. Really? 
I don't think so. That's what Jesus says. They won't listen to the prophets. They wouldn't even listen if someone should rise from the dead. Who better than Jesus to talk about rising from the dead? Who better than Jesus whom himself knew as the omniscient God beyond all time knew that when he rose from the dead there would still be people who would deny him. There are still people in the world today who deny Jesus. They don't even know him well enough to deny him, but they deny that he rose from the dead. They deny that he taught all truth. They deny that he is truth itself. And so they ignore him to their own detriment, just as they ignore Moses and the prophets to their own detriment. This is an incredible passage that we have before us today. Jesus identifies Lazarus, the rich man, as being in a place of fire and torment. And where does he say Lazarus is? He's in the bosom of Abraham. That's a nice phrase to use. Does that mean that he's in heaven? Absolutely not. The gates of heaven were closed at the sin of Adam and Eve. So they're not in the place of eternal torment. And Christ is telling the story so he hasn't died and risen from the dead and ascended to the Father's hand and opened the gates of paradise for you and I. So the gates of paradise are closed. The place of fiery torment isn't where, a, where Lazarus is. Where is Lazarus? Of course, some people would argue that he's in New Jersey. <laughs> and I say they don't deserve to live in such a beautiful garden state. <laughs> there are people who would say there is no purgatory. Because at the end of our lives, we either go to heavenly glory, which is where everyone goes, or a few, very few, possibly go to hell. Really, that's not what we read in the diary of St. Faustina. In the diary of St. Faustina, we hear very clearly that when she visited hell, it was quite well populated, sadly enough. When she visited purgatory, she was almost overcome, she said. If her angel didn't hold her hand firmly, she might not have been able to endure it. And so I say to those of you who are thinking about this holy soul's sodality, who are members of the Holy Soul Sodality. And I say to you, you and I do not want to spend one moment in purgatory. Not one moment, certainly not a full day. And yet you and I know from the visions and the words of great mystic saints that there are souls that have spent long times in purgatory. When the Blessed Mother appeared to the Fatima children, they asked about a young girl, and, they, and the Mother of God said that she would be there until the end of time. What sin could a 12-year-old girl, a peasant in a rural village, have so committed that would cause her to be there for so long a time? You and I have a great deal to do with that. Do we pray for our loved ones? Do we pray for the ones who have done good for us? Maybe even pray for the unseen, unthought of people that have helped us in our lifetime. Doctors and nurses, priests and deacons and religious, Policemen and firemen, 
emergency technicians. Maybe it was just uh, somebody's secretary. Maybe it was the driver of the bus that we took to work. There are all sorts of people who touch our lives and after they're no longer a part of our lives, we no longer think about them. When I pray for the souls in purgatory, I try to be mindful of priests especially, and in a very special way, diocesan priests. Because I know that we religious, because we are members of a religious family, pray for the souls of other religious priests on a regular basis, especially within our own community. But I think of the extraordinary diocesan priest who have touched my life. I received baptism from a diocesan priest. I received first communion from a diocesan priest. It was a diocesan priest who became a bishop who confirmed me. It was a diocesan priest who became a bishop that ordained me. Father Sopochko was a diocesan priest. And Father Sopochko, if he had not taken the diaries of St. Faustina and translated them, wrote them down in good Polish, you and I would not have the diary today. I often think about that, that in fact, if he hadn't received the diary from the congregation of Our Lady of Mercy, the sisters who gave them those original journals, they could have just rotted away in a chest somewhere in the basement of the convent. Maybe a few people would have heard about the devotion. Maybe in Vilnius they would pray it on a regular basis. But it's doubtful that it would have gone very far. It's doubtful that it would have spread throughout Poland even. It was one of the concerns that Father Sopochko had. And when he handed the message on to Father Joseph Zizembowski, a Marian of the Immaculate Conception, who brought it to the United States, who in a sense is the connection we have back in time through preaching about divine mercy? What if he had, had made that connection? What if he got back to the United States and just forgot about it all and left it in his valise? He could have gone on with his life and it would not have changed his life greatly. Sometimes the decision to do one right thing has an influence beyond our imagination. The decision to do one right thing might not even cost us very much, but it might have an ongoing effect in the lives of other people. It's hard to imagine how many right decisions were necessary to bring about even this holy soul sodality that we might aid one another in our prayer and shore up one another in our devotions. <clears throat>